Hi, I'm Ryan Hare, and I'm coming to you from Pullman, Washington. Yakima Sipity audiences know me as their principal bassoonist, and I'm very privileged and honored to hold that position. Indeed, the bassoon has been very important to me through my whole life. I've been performing it since 15, and I had my first professional paid job at 18. But what many of you might not know is that I'm primarily a composer. In fact, all of my academic degrees, all of my formal training is in composition. I haven't played in front of an audience since February. It's the longest I've gone without playing a concert for a live audience since I was in middle school, and I've lost a considerable amount of money as a result. It's a problem for musicians everywhere. Despite all that, I've been practicing a lot, and in fact, I have a lot of things to share on the bassoon. But uh, today, right now, I'm coming to share with you something else, a series of compositions I've been working on all summer. It all came about when my friend Fred Corman, the longtime former principal oboist of the Oregon Symphony, and I were having a conversation on Facebook with trumpet player James Smock about how much we were going to miss each other, seeing as the summer concerts we had been scheduled to perform together had been canceled. I remarked that I missed composing music for Fred, who a few years ago commissioned my oboe concerto and premiered it in Portland, Oregon. He said that I should compose for him an etude, an unaccompanied musical study that would be predominantly lyrical, explore the low range of the oboe, and include a high G. And so I did. I called it Lyric Etude. Fred was very enthusiastic about the piece, and frankly so was I. Our shared enthusiasm prompted our trumpet player friend James Smock to also request an etude, and so I wrote Lyric Etude Number 2. And in fact, that's what you've been hearing in the background in a wonderful recording that James Smock recorded within a week after I composed it. Next, I have for you a video excerpt of Fred's performance of what I now call Lyric Etude Number 1. <laughs> Soon after James Smock's recording appeared, more requests started coming in for more lyric etudes for tuba, trombone, saxophone, timpani, cello, viola, piccolo, yes, bassoon, and more. I actually finished number 16 for violin earlier this month. Each of them was requested by a musician, friend, and colleague, and in one case, a former student. And I realized very early on what a blessing composing these was going to be, even though I was not receiving the payment for commissions I would normally expect. But in maintaining and nourishing the personal and musical connectivity that we were missing, 
while we were all out of work and sheltering at home during the recent pandemic, that became its own reward. What you've been hearing just now is lyric etude number four for trombone, which was requested by and is dedicated to the Yakima Symphony's very own principal trombonist, Sarah Mayo. Coincidentally, she also performed at the premiere of the Opal Concerto that I composed for Fred Corman. He had requested the concerto include an obligatory solo trombone part. Lyric etude number nine is for bass clarinet. It was requested by and is dedicated to Andy Hudson. I'm including video excerpts of a recording he made of his premiere performance because of his comments, which are deeply touching, and express cogently how precious musical connections really are to all of us. Ryan and I became friends a number of years ago and we've stayed close ever since, and I've always admired not only his musicianship, but also his heart. Ryan decided during the quarantine that he was going to begin composing etudes for his friends as gifts, musical gifts to bring light into the darkness. And this etude particularly, number nine, I think gives us a chance to think about what it means that we are not alone. Although we've been isolated from one another, this piece, to me, is a conversation. You're going to hear a few gestures that unfold, sort of technical, expressive, romantic gestures. And then you're going to hear a response in the distance. Here's what you're going to hear. <laughs> Ryan gave the piece the subtitle Homage to Jean Sibelius, and so I imagine us walking through a forest far in the north in early summer, and I imagine the feeling of calling into the distance and just hoping someone, anyone, hears you and calls back. And in this etude, you're going to hear a few times that the bass clarinet becomes sort of ravenously impassioned and calls out, and then in the distance we hear that call. Three times we hear it. And what I like about this piece is that it reminds me that when I call out to someone, I'm not alone. I hope this piece will give you the idea to believe that you're not alone. Lyric Etude Number 9, Homage to Jean Sibelius by Ryan Hare. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> What you're seeing and hearing is a small excerpt from Lyric Etude Number 6 for Timpani. It was requested by and composed for Not Drum. I should probably say something about the title of these compositions. The word Lyric, of course, refers to the text of a song, the words that are sung. And we have the adjective Lyrical, which means song-like. We instrumental musicians are often asked to play as if singing. 
After all, the voice is the first melodic instrument humans ever had. The word lyric, by connection, also refers to poetry and to any sort of story or drama set to music. In my lyric etudes, in addition to thinking more about melody and song than, for example, virtuosity and technique, I was also thinking about stories. The stories we all have that are our lives, especially those during the pandemic. None of these pieces is really about trying to express any sort of literal narrative. But I did have various scenes in mind for each of them, sometimes suggested by the tempo marking, and sometimes by the subtitle. Form for you lyric etude number 14 for bassoon. This wasn't composed for me, I composed it for Chris Garza, my friend, who asked for it. Enjoy. <laughs> for listening and watching.